Welcome to another edition of Southern Home Talk. This is how to operate your new Southern home. It's going to be a little bit different here in the South than it would be in other parts of the country. We face so many different challenges down here as a result. I hope this live presentation really helps you because I think this is going to be the first of its kind that pretty much addresses the specific issues that address our houses here in South Alabama. There may be some parts of this presentation you already know, but there may be other parts that you don't. But it's really important that you and the rest of your family view this slide presentation because you may not be around in an emergency and they themselves may have to be the ones to address these problems. So please stay tuned and please stay patient through the slide presentation. Thanks. Congratulations on your new home purchase. Or maybe you bought a house that's several decades old. It don't really matter too much. You still have to maintain it. And it's very important that you do this because most of the time, the lack of maintenance creates latent issues. These are problems that are not visible to you and they express themselves just from the simple lack of maintenance. It's very important that you maintain your house. It'll also decrease its value over the years for failing to do so. That's why home inspectors are hired to come in and look at these issues. And a lot of times it's a surprise to the owners themselves. They had no clue that these problems were going on in the background. And most of it's just simple lack of maintenance. You're pulling into your new driveway and all of a sudden you start to notice cracking in it. This isn't uncommon. Small cracks like this here are quite common in concrete driveways. There's even a saying, the only way to stop concrete from cracking is to leave it on the truck. But these cracks do need to be monitored in case they do start to get wider. But one thing you want to keep in mind is the expansion joints themselves. You shouldn't allow vegetation or weeds to grow in these because they can widen this gap here and actually contribute to cracking. So it's always good to keep weed killer in these areas to prevent this from happening. Small cracks are common. You're gonna find them in your patio, your front porch area, and in your driveway. You also wanna maintain your driveway too, and there's ways to do this. See episode 31 of Southern Home Talk. We go into further detail about maintaining driveways. It's not uncommon to have some degree of cracking in concrete walls. Up here on the left, you can see a very thin stair step crack. This is caused by the brick lintel expanding and contracting. This is quite common. What's not common is in the right. You can see very long horizontal widening gaps and it's stair stepped here. This crack actually goes further than what's pictured. These are the kind of cracks you should be concerned about and a structural engineer should be called for full evaluation. Looking at this wall structure here, you can tell that you don't have to have anything even really close to the house for it to create problems. If you look right here, you can see this round area, and this is because this utility shed is real close to it. And what's contributing to this is rain is coming off the roof, hitting the top of this and bouncing back against the wall structure here. This is all mold and fungus. The best practice is to keep pretty much anything and everything as far away from the wall structure as possible. You can see this is also leaning up against the wall. This is gonna create problems at the bottom level too. This is one area where you don't wanna to try to keep up with the Joneses. Pretty much any neighborhood you drive through, you can see probably more than half the houses have vegetation growing too close to the structure. And this is bad for many reasons. I had a friend of mine who was hanging hurricane shutters during one of the hurricanes back in the mid 2000s. They got bit on the elbow by a pygmy rattler that was inside the leaf litter or inside the bushes itself. And so that's one reason, but there are many others. The primary one being that vegetation will hold moisture for a long period of time. This can actually penetrate the wall structure and create mold issues inside. Brick is very porous, it will absorb water. It's just not good to have vegetation growing real close to the structure. 
This picture on the left shows what the wall looks like after bushes have been removed. You can see the long running staining going all the way down the wall. All this is fungus and mold and dirt that has attached itself to it. If you go further down, what looks like a shadow here is really a continuation of fungus and mold. And probably what's contributed to this is water coming off the roof, hitting the air conditioner and splashing back to the wall structure. On the right, you can see steps that have a lot of weeds growing through the mortar joints. And this is a good example of how brick and mortar can hold moisture for long periods of time. And why all brick should be cleaned and sealed with good brick sealers. So don't never allow this to continue on because what can happen is, is these weeds will widen these mortar joints even more than what they are and can actually start separating the bricks. I highly recommend that you keep your brickwork clean and keep a good brick sealer on it. Uh, I recommend Zycoseal, which you'll see in a coming slide. One of the best products I've ever tested has been Zycoseal. This is a product made in India and available online. Now, there are similar products to this that may work just as well. But since I personally have tested this one, I can vouch for it. Zycoseal Zydex is a chemical compound that's used on brick, masonry, and also block. And it's best well applied during the fall time of the year when we do have dry weather. You want this brick or your concrete to be as dry as possible before it's applied. The best practice is to wait till it rains and either power wash it the day it rains or the day after, and especially if there's gonna be about two weeks of dry weather after the rainfall. You really want to get the brick or concrete as dry as possible before this is applied. It is a concentrate and it is a little bit expensive. This one gallon jug's about $200, but it was enough to do the entire 2,000 square foot house, including the driveway. You really want to be careful about how you apply this and read the directions. If you overspray your windows, it will permanently etch them. This product was supposed to last about 10 years. I applied this in 2016 and it looks like my house was power washed yesterday. I highly recommend Zycosil. This is the best practice when it comes to flower beds. You'll notice that the plants are at least two or three feet away from the wall structure. They're also small in statute, which will allow these plants to evaporate a lot quicker. Another thing too is the flower bed itself is not mulch, straw, or wood chips. Those three items there are not good for many reasons. One, they will hold moisture to the area, and two, they're very conducive to termites, including other types of insects. This costs a little bit more to do, but the good thing about rocks is they last forever. And if you get the larger, regular sized ones like in this photograph here, you can come in here with your leaf blower and blow this flower bed out with no problem. As the old saying goes, there's nothing like having a good roof over your head. Well, in order to keep that good roof, it requires maintenance too. Whatever you do, don't allow debris to pile up on it. You can see in this photograph here on the left that even though this is a very steep incline, debris can still pile up on it. And often what will happen is it'll dam up on the gutters. In the right photograph, you can see in the valleys where it's starting to pile up and creating a dam. The bad thing about this is, is underneath this gutter is probably wood, more than likely wood fascia and soffit. This will hold moisture and over time start rotting this underneath it. I'm personally no big fan of gutters at all because I've, so far I have not found a single gutter system that works. It always has one issue or another. Either it clogs up with debris or if it has screens, it will dam up over the screen or it will hold water creating mosquito habitat for that. I'm just not a big fan of these. But if you do have gutters on your house, it's important to keep them cleaned and maintained. If you have gutters, more than likely you have these downspouts that come down in several areas around the house. It's important that leaders be attached to this and extended out at least five to six feet. 
And if that can't be done, at bare minimum, splash pads should be added to avoid the erosion of what you can see here. In the right photograph, we have another house where it's been pretty well maintained the roof. Even the gutters appear clear. I'm still no fan of gutters because even with clear gutters like this, often water stands in these, creating the perfect mosquito habitat. Well, this is absolutely better than gutters in my opinion. If you put large irregular sized rocks or ballast around all sides of your house, this should do a very good job in protecting the foundation and also stop erosion. This has been placed probably seven to eight feet away from the foundation, which is outstanding. However, maybe even three feet would be acceptable depending on how far out your soffit extends from the wall structure. Another thing too, if you have a crawl space, which is what these vents are, your crawl space should be encapsulated and these vents should be sealed up to prevent moisture from entering in the crawl space. But just know this, gravel can be, is readily available. All you have to do is go to Google and type in gravel supplier. This can be delivered by the truckload. Take the time to look up at your roof. What may have been a really nice roof job that was done not too long ago, you can eventually start seeing some lifted areas in your shingles. The left photograph depicts raised roofing nails, which has lifted the shingles here. And you should go up or have someone go up that's capable to go up and nail these shingle tabs back down. You don't want to have these in a lifted state because even a thunderstorm can start lifting and blowing away the shingles off the top of the roof if they've got this kind of lift here. In the right photograph, you can see a nail that was just simply left loose on the roof and it has migrated underneath another shingle tab and has lifted it there. I found this on several tabs on a roof inspection I did. It wasn't the nail that had raised, it was actually just a loose nail that had migrated underneath another shingle. If you have a newer house, there's a possibility you have what they call continuous soffit or continuously vented soffit. And all these areas here are either vinyl or metal. And if you do have those, you still need to keep those areas clean. But what we're looking at in this picture here is wood, fascia, and soffit. And this should not go ignored. But this may appear to be a cosmetic problem, but it's really more than that. Moisture is attracted to dry areas, and naturally it's going to be drier underneath this going into the attic area. So as this gets wet, it will wick its way into the attic space and potentially create mold issues there. Anytime you have this degree of decay in your fascia or your soffit, this should be replaced and repaired. What I recommend doing is cutting this out, just this one section, however far back you've got to cut out. Go to Home Depot or Lowe's and purchase one by six, in this case, treated lumber. Allow it to dry inside your shed or garage. And after it's thoroughly dried, then put several good coats of paint on it, preferably using the additive M1, which is a very good fungicide. But please don't allow this to carry on because it will create big problems for you. Looking at this picture on the left, you can see pretty much long-term neglect where Nothing's been done to either mitigate this or correct it. And what's contributed to this problem is the leaf litter on the roof line. Wood is a very poor substance, much like brick is. And also wood is a very good food source for some types of fungus and mold. So it creates the perfect environment for it. What needs to happen is all this needs to be cleaned off. And then a very good exterior grade paint with the substance called M1 fungicide added to the paint. This does a pretty good job in repelling this type of fungus. And the picture on the right, what we can see is a lot of leaf litter has been piled up and also bags of mulch left here and old planters. The old planters can hold moisture and can breed mosquitoes. The mulch that's been left behind can actually create a bridge for insects and termites to enter the wood structure. It's just not good to do this, and it's destructive to your house. 
Okay, it's 11 o'clock at night, and there's water pouring down out of your ceiling. What do we do? And it's pouring down pretty good. You're probably in a panic right about now. And now's the time you start to think, how do I turn the water off? And even a bigger panic can set in if you don't know how to do that. That's why it's really important that you and the rest of your family knows how to turn off the water at the meter. I would recommend going to your local hardware store and purchasing what's known as a water meter key here in the right picture. This is designed to turn the water off at the main. You can see this cupped in here. This will fit over this little slot and you can turn the top with your hand. If you don't have one of these, it's possible you might be able to turn this with a crescent wrench, but it'd be harder to do it with that. That's why I recommend that you go and purchase a water meter key and have it put in a location where everybody knows where it's at, because there will come a time where you're gonna to have to turn your water off in an emergency. It's just a matter of time before that happens. You may be one of the lucky ones and actually have a secondary cutoff valve to shut the water off to the house. That's what you're looking at in this picture. This is a ball valve and it's really the best type of valve to have for a shutoff. And it just takes a simple pulling of this lever around to cut the water off. If the only method you have of cutting off the water is your water meter, I think it's well worth the money to hire a plumber to come out and add a secondary cutoff because it's just a matter of time before you have an emergency where you're going to have to cut the water off. Not only that, but we tend not to think about our water meter box. And so let's say you had an emergency and that was the only place you had to cut the water off. You, you have a water meter key, like I've explained in the other slide, but you go out there and the water meter box is full of dirt. And now you have to dig out the box to find the valve to cut it off there. So of all the home improvement things, I think this is one of the most important things to do is to add a secondary way of cutting off the water to the house. I do quite a few inspections and I have quite a few people ask me, what is this pipe sticking up out of the ground with this white cap on top of it. And that's part of the reason why I did this series here. I mean, all of us don't know everything and I certainly don't. I didn't know this first starting out myself. I had to learn this. But what this is in this left picture is what's called the clean out. And if you're lucky enough to have this, not every house is gonna have a clean out, but if it's newer and hopefully they followed code, Somewhere around the house, there should be a pipe sticking up somewhere with this cap on there, and that's called the clean out. And what it's designed to do is to create another avenue to clear blockages in the main sewer. This cap will unthread. You take a pair of channel locks, maybe a bigger crescent wrench and put on here, can you unthread this cap? Sometimes they're not even on there that tight. You may be able to remove it with your hand. But you don't want to allow this to be covered up with yard debris because sometimes I do inspections and I cannot find the clean out. And it's not that they didn't put one in. It's just that the homeowner or the previous homeowners have just allowed the ground to cover it up and can't be found anymore. So this needs to be accessible because there's going to come a time where you're going to have a plumbing clog. And this is going to be the point where you're going to clear that clog. In the right picture, if you don't have a clean out, this is a secondary option to clear plumbing clogs. This is the roof vent on top of the roof. If you have a serious clog in your plumbing system, normally what will happen is a plumber will come and run a snake down this and snake out whatever the issue is. If you have the capabilities to do this, you can do it yourself. Another way to clear clogs from these drains is to pour a drain opener down this as well. However, there's only certain drain openers that only the plumbers are allowed to have to, to use in this part of the vent, especially the more powerful ones. You pretty much have to have a plumbing license to get those. And I don't quite blame them because they are very dangerous chemicals. However, Home Depot and Lowe's do have some chemicals that are fairly decent if you pour these down the drain pipes and will sometimes open up these clogs. But if it's really tough, you probably are gonna have to call a plumber to come clear it. 
Okay, well, if you're unfortunate to have one of these systems here, I feel for you. But, you know, as the saying goes, it is what it is. Uh, this is a grinder pump system or a sewer grinder pump. And it consists of this well here, which has a grinder pump inside of it, this control box, and it's got a little red light on the top of it. And it's got a sewer clean out. And that's what you also want to know where that is as well. You don't want to allow that to be covered up to where you can't find it. But the way these work is that your sewer line comes into this, probably from this direction here, flows into this well, and the pump comes on and it grinds up the waste products that comes out of the house and pumps it to through the uh, sewer line to the main. A lot of the newer neighborhoods have these, uh, and a lot of the new neighborhoods don't, so it's kind of a mixed match with that. But if you do have one of these systems here, they require maintenance. And what I recommend doing is probably what your neighbors are doing if you live in the neighborhood with, that have these, is to get on a service plan uh, with one of the plumbing companies or sewer companies that come out and do periodic maintenance on these. You're also limited to what you can put in this system too. So you need to become familiar what those items are that should be put in here. I'm not gonna go over that in this slide because there's too many of them, but do become familiar what can and cannot be put through this system because it can mess this up and it can create a pretty expensive repair. I think these pumps are around $1,500. So it's not cheap to have one of these replaced. So just know and that these things do require maintenance. And this red light up here at the top, it can mean several different things. I've, when I've done some of my inspections, what happens is, is I'll go inside the house and I'll fill up every bathtub in there. And before I leave, I will pull the plug on all the bathtubs and I'll run out here to this because that's really the only way I have of testing these. And I'll see, if, I'll just listen out for the pump and see if it cuts on and see if it sounds okay, if it's not have any grinding bearings. But sometimes this red light will come on uh, when that happens. And what that means is the float switch is, has risen higher than the level it should be. And it's just simply got too much water coming into the system at one time. And usually that light will go off after it drains out. But if you see this light flashing, and it, sometimes it may just be in the on position constantly, that means you're probably gonna have to have someone to come out there and service this. So hopefully you don't have one of these systems on your house, but if you do, just know that there's maintenance involved in keeping them up. If you have leaking faucets, you wanna repair those. Sometimes it's not that hard to do. Let's take this hose bib on the right, or hose valve, whichever you want to call it. It has a nut right here. And often what happens is, is a lot of the leaks are just around the valve stem. So what you'd want to do is open up this valve a little bit. You don't want to do this while the valve's closed. Open it up a little bit, maybe halfway. Let the water run while it's doing it. And take you up a wrench and tighten up this nut. And sometimes that will fix leaky valve stems just by tightening up this nut here. But if you can't repair it by tightening this up, it probably should be replaced. On this wall, this is actually great stuff, which is a foam product, and it was used to seal this opening here. And that should be done as well. You don't never want to have any voids in your walls where insects can go in not only that, it protects this leaky faucet from draining the water back into the wall cavity. On the left picture, that's what's happened. This faucet here may have a small leak, but it's contributed to this large problem down below, which supported plant growth. It's been so moist here. But not only that, but if this faucet is leaking, it could be wicking water back into the wall cavity as well. And there may be a substantial damage inside this wall. We just don't know because we can't see through it. But the biggest thing is you don't want to allow faucets to contribute to moisture problems. We already have enough of that already with the wet climate that we're in. What you're looking at in this picture is a tankless 
hot water heater. Some people call them continuous hot water. There's several different companies that make them. This is a natural gas model. And all the ones I've tested so far, it seems like natural gas is better. But I do recommend adding a filter to it, which is in the right picture. Uh, this will probably help your unit last a lot longer. Some of these actually require some maintenance. Some of them require back flushing occasionally. So I recommend getting the owner's manual and seeing what the required maintenance is to keeping yours up. If you're fortunate enough to have natural gas, usually the meter will be placed either on the right or left side of the house. And this is the, uh, the gas main here, it's called the gas main. And if you ever smell gas coming out from one of these here, you need to contact the gas company. Now it's not uncommon to occasionally get a whiff of natural gas and it vents occasionally through this port right here. But if it's continuous, it probably does have a leak around one of these fittings here and should be checked by the gas company. You can check these leaks yourself by, if it's not too bad, by mixing up some soapy water and just simply pouring around these fittings. And if you see it bubbling up, you pretty much know you got some sort of leak. But you do need to know how to turn off the gas here. Uh, hopefully you won't never have an emergency that requires this, but in case you ever do, you need to know where to do it and how. This is going to be the gas shutoff in the right picture. And you would take a, preferably a, a large crescent wrench. That's what I use to turn it off. And some of these can be pretty tough to turn. So you would take this here and turn it in line with this other one here. And there's a hole in this one and a hole in that one. And it's aligned that way so a padlock can be put through it. So just so you know, that's what those two holes are for. And you'll know it's shut off when this is turned where it lines up with the other holes where a padlock can be put through both parts. Hopefully when your house was built, whoever installed your appliances at the house also added these auxiliary shutoff valves for your natural gas appliances. Say your stove, your water heater, oven, whatever else, the furnace in the attic, it should have an independent shutoff valve. When you see this valve stem in line with the pipe, like in the left picture, that should indicate that the gas is on. In the right, you see it's turned crossways, and that should indicate that the gas is off. You really can't go by this all the time, because sometimes I've seen it, I don't know if this can be done with this type of valve here, where the handle's been put on backwards. So you have, just have to be careful about that. But hopefully you will have auxiliary cutoff valves to the appliances that, that's running natural gas. And here it is again. This is the natural gas valve at the meter. You can see in the right picture, there's a large crescent wrench and a large pair of channel lock pliers. Either one of these will work. I find that the crescent wrench probably works the best in turning these valves off. These can be pretty tight. And so sometimes you may have to put quite a bit of leverage to get these to move. But you can see in the left picture where I have the crescent wrench adjusted to the valve and just simply pull up and may have to pull up hard and align these two holes with the other one. So where a padlock can be put through both. And that should indicate the lock position for turning off your natural gas at the main. Most of us here in South Alabama have wood frame exterior doors and about 70% of the inspections I go to, I find some sort of issue with moisture. This particular door here, the brick mold and the framing are rotted, which is not uncommon, especially down at the bottom part of it. This is partly due this the continuous moist area down here at ground level, plus rainwater will usually splash and hit this part. It's really important that you use a very good high quality exterior grade paint. And there again, I recommend using this product called M1, M as in Mary. Uh, most paint stores have that and add that to the paint because it also works as a fungicide, it's pretty good. But you'll need to apply more than two or three coats to really put some protection on these areas. It should really be 
pasted on your door frames pretty heavy. And you also want to keep these door frames caulked extremely well at the bottom too. I know it's tempting to want to use pure silicone there, but the problem with using silicone is usually the concrete is always damp and it won't bond unless it's totally dry. So I recommend using a good latex exterior caulk, maybe a mixed silicone caulk to where it doesn't have to doesn't need complete dryness for this caulk to set. You also you can see that being a steel door is starting to rust. So this is a pretty uh, important area that you should protect because what can happen is is as this gets moist, this can wick inside the house into the uh, baseboards around the corner and even get into the wall cavity. But not only that, this can make a pretty easy avenue for uh, insects, including termites. Uh, this door on the right is missing the weather seal, and I find this quite often in a lot of inspections and a lot of times on newer houses. Well, this is wrong for obvious reasons. I mean, you're letting air conditioning out, uh, but you could be letting it in. And so if you have a closed return, if the return air is fairly close to this door, it may be drawing outside air in through this crevice here. But not only that, you know, it's legging insects inside the house. So if you have deteriorated weather stripping or gaps like this, you know, those should be filled up. Not all siding is the same. Uh, we're looking at two different types of siding here. One on the left is probably masonite or hardy board or some similar composite. The one on the right is vinyl siding. And they make these in different grades, especially the vinyl. They, you know, when you think vinyl siding, you think of it's all just one brand and one grade. And that's not really the case at all. Uh, they make these in thinner, much thinner grades. Uh, in fact, I, I don't even think they should make them. But they do, and they put them on these new houses. And I don't know if I would want to ha have a house with this on it because this house is not but around seven or eight years old and it's already starting to crack in significantly in several areas this is just one picture here this crack was probably caused by a lawnmower slinging something through it but we live in a hurricane zone and we're going to get them uh, i've been through many hurricanes starting back 64 hurricane betsy camille oh, i can't name them all there's been so many but since we do have these, and it's just a matter of time before we get more of them, I just don't find this to be a very good product to use on a house. So, but you still need to maintain your siding. Uh, you shouldn't allow cracks like this. They should be repaired, especially the one on the left because it's higher up. And so, you know, if you do have a, a even a thunderstorm that has driving rain, it's gonna put moisture back behind this wall cavity here. And you can even get it all the way as far as the sheetrock inside the house, depending on how well the, the vapor barrier is underneath this. It just should be repaired. All, anytime you see siding like this, it's more than a cosmetic issue. You should take the time and have, this, have these uh, damaged areas repaired. If you have a brick house, you may have noticed some of these holes in the side of your brickwork. And these are called weep holes. They're intentionally there to allow moisture to escape the wall cavity in case any moisture was to build there. It, it would have an escape route. And I've done inspections where I have found these caulked up. And I assume that the homeowner thought that this was just shoddy masonry work and they failed to put mortar in those places. Well, now with those being caulked up, if there was a moisture issue behind the wall, uh, they've actually stopped the, the place for that moisture to escape. So just know what these are. These are weep holes that were intentionally put there. And I also mark it up as a defect if they're not there. Uh, sometimes you have to pay attention to more of what's not there than what is. And so hopefully your brick wall has these placed in the foundation. And they should be spaced, I think, around 10 feet apart. So just know that's what they're there for. This one on the right has a screen placed in it, which is acceptable. It's allowing, you know, air movement into this uh, cavity. 
I don't know how good that's going to do stopping small insects, but that's acceptable. What you don't want to do is fill this up with caulk or spray foam. The exterior side of your windows are very important to maintain. This was a brand new house I inspected it hadn't been lived in yet. And in the corner, you can see that there's no caulking. But all exterior windows should be caulked all the way up and all the way around the outer frames where this gap cannot be exposed. This will easily allow the transfer of air to and from inside the house and also a moisture penetration point. This screw is the screw for the storm panels that are normally stored in the attic space. So just know what these are. If you have exterior lighting on the side of the house, it's very important that you caulk around the base plates of these light fixtures. This is where it meets the electrical box. And this is to prevent wind-driven rain from coming in behind this and entering the box behind it. But also we have hurricanes too, which can drive water to the wall structure for hours at a time. So what I do recommend doing is caulking around the entire base of this and maybe leaving a little opening here at the bottom in case any moisture does get trapped it can get out. But this fixture also has one of these curly cube bulbs and they're really called a CFL and they're not very efficient compared to LED and they're also not exterior rated too. So try to avoid these CFL bulbs at all costs, especially as cheap as LED bulbs have become. But just make sure that whatever bulb that you use in this fixture is exterior rated so it doesn't short out. I would say more than half of us here in South Alabama have a wood deck somewhere on our house. Usually it's on the back side of it. Well, if you have one, they do require maintenance and they can be quite pricey to maintain depending on how big your deck is and how well it was built. This photograph, you can see that there's some leaves been piled up here. This was a photograph I took of an inspection. And so my theory was is that the homeowner there probably did blow off a lot of this leaves that were piled up over this part as well because it was really slippery and moist when I got there. And this is probably just the leaves that fell from the day before. And you can't really allow debris to uh, pile up on your deck regardless of the treatment level that it has. It will certainly cause your deck boards to rot in short order. And if not that, I mean, it will create this fungus and mold like you see here. And it's pretty slippery. You can slip and fall on this. Some of these boards are, are lifted. Uh, they probably have just gotten rotted to the degree to where the nails don't even hold them anymore. So some of this lumber may have to be replaced. But the short of this is don't allow leaves and debris to pile up on your deck. Keep it blown off. And if you have a deck that's in this condition here, replace the bad boards, but also come and power wash it really good, preferably on the day that it rains or the day after. And that's also looking at a window of having maybe one or two weeks of dry weather ahead. Because that's the time you want to let your lumber get as dry as it can possibly get before you stain it. I used a product called Ready Seal on my deck and I put it on back in 2016. And it was only supposed to be good for two years and it's still holding up fairly well. And that's even in our climate that we're in now. In the bright picture, these are fence boards and they're treated too, but they're making direct ground contact. And as I said before, most treated lumber is not rated for ground contact and it will rot as a result. Even these deck boards are not rated for ground contact. The only lumber that is, is the post on the end. Usually all your fence, your posting are four by four, six by sixes or whatever was used here. They know that those are gonna be put in the ground and as a result, they're treated for ground contact. So if you have stair stringers that go down and they're making ground contact down there, chances are they're gonna rot over time. So the main thing is, and the main point is to maintain your deck. And hopefully some of these pointers I've given you will help you. Well, hopefully I haven't bored you too much with this presentation, but I put all these points in here because these are issues I have discovered on, in mo I'd say more than half my inspections. And so as a result, I felt like that they ought to be in here. 
uh, some of this stuff that I went over, you probably already know. And I hope that you'll stay patient because there may be some things in here that you probably don't know or maybe forgot. But these are important things to to really know and especially to especially as part of maintaining your house and the safety of it. And this slide is a good example of that. And that's the main panel on the side of your house. I mean, most of us hardly ever go into that. And and probably the only time you're ever going to go into it is if you have an emergency or you're replacing an appliance or whatever and you need to go come out here and cut off the breaker. But the thing of it is, if you ever did have an emergency where this had to be cut off, well, look what might be greeting you when you open up the panel. And this is a wasp nest here. It was an active wasp nest. And I've run into this quite frequently. This is not an unusual thing to run into. Whenever I approach these panel, uh, especially the exterior main panels, I'm on the alert to have to bail real quick when I open the lid on these because I'm, I'm expecting to see this. And so what happens is, is how do they get in there? Well, if these holes underneath here provide the perfect place for them to get into your panel, and these should be sealed. And for more than just the wasp, because I've come in some of these panels and have seen electrocuted lizards across some of the, the wires in here. And this can create a fire hazard if that happens. So it's more than just wasp. You know, snakes can get in this. Uh, you just want to keep all of the, the openings of the panel closed for that reason. So, you know, be mindful of your exterior panel. Uh, if you got holes, seal them up. And also keep the protective plate over this as well. This cut, this panel here was actually missing the protective cover plate, which would cover up the left and the right side where pretty much all you would see would be just the breakers. I don't know why they took it off and threw it away, but you know, that actually made it even better for the wasp. So anyway, you know, just watch out for that sort of thing. And this is another example of a photograph I would never thought I'd have to put in a presentation and that's vegetation blocking the main panel. Uh, there's no way to get into this to open the panel box. And this was an inspection that I did and I couldn't inspect the panel because the vegetation had grown to such a degree that I could not get back there to, to open the panel. And so, you know, that wasn't good for the homeowner because, or the buyer, because now, you know, we have a, a main panel here that's gone uninspected, but it's really bad in another reason too, because this has to be accessible. I mean, for many reasons, one thing is if the house ever catches on fire, you know, the fire department's gonna come in and wanna cut the power off and they're gonna have a hard time doing that in this situation. You could have an emergency to where you need to cut the power off and you're not gonna be able to do it either. Uh, another reason is that all this vegetation is holding moisture back to this panel. So, you know, you do have aluminum entrance wires that come into this and so, high moisture can actually accelerate the oxidation of that aluminum wiring. And I can go on and on, but I won't. You know, don't allow vegetation to cover up your main panel boxes or any other uh, type of appliance that may be serving the house. And the right picture is pretty much what you'd see on some of the newer houses. And some of them have more than one main panel or one main and one sub panel that, that works as another panel servicing other areas. But when you have panel boxes on the exterior part of the house, they should be caulked along the tops and the sides. Sides and the tops all the way down, sides, tops all the way down. But you don't want to caulk underneath the bottom parts of these. And the reason for that is, so if water does get trapped behind the box, it can run out. And when I'm saying caulk, I'm talking about between the brick and the panel. The, where, where it meets the brick wall, that's the area that should be caulked. And I'm surprised of how many home inspections I do on new constructed houses where they should know to do this. That's often one of the defects I find. 
So maintain your vegetation. And if you don't have your panels caulked like they should be, you know, that's something you might be able to take up on your own and do, but I highly recommend you do it. Okay, well, hopefully you don't have any vegetation blocking your main panel. And so that's what we're looking at here again in this picture. And so this, these lids open up different ways depending on the brand of them. And that's something you need to become familiar with too, is be, become familiar how to open up the panel. Uh, because like I say, there's maybe emergency that's gonna come around and it would be pretty frustrating to, to not have your panel blocked by anything and knowing how to flip the breaker, but you don't know how to open up the, the cover. And so these are sort of things that you, sh you should practice and not only you, but the rest of the family, if they're capable of doing such tasks, they should be trained to do this as well because you might not be around, you know, when emergency comes, comes up and they may be the ones that have to come out and do this. So become familiar with your panel and how they open up. In the right picture, this is pretty much what you'll see on most of your exterior panels. A lot of times they'll have three, four, maybe even six breakers in there, and they're serving different areas. Uh, usually they're, they're going to be serving the bigger appliances like the dryer. They're on a two-pole breaker, 240 volts. The house has a grinder pump. That's going to be 240. Air conditioner's on 240. Stove's 240. Uh, this is probably the water heater. At, 240 volts and this main here is probably going to be 100 amps and that's marked main for a reason this is the breaker that services the sub panel inside the house and usually that's going to be the electrical panel that's more than likely in your laundry room or in the garage and that's what feeds that panel and so if you ever had an emergency you probably want to come out here to the main panel and trip this breaker here at the main, and that's going to cut off the power, you know, to the sub panel in the house. And the sub panel is going to be feeding pretty much all your lighting and your electrical outlets all throughout the house. And so this would be a good place to come and trip that one main breaker until you could take the time to maybe find out what the culprit is that's creating the problem for you. But you would also need to know that these other breakers exist as well. So you know, if you had a problem with your dryer and the, the outlet was smoking inside your laundry room, you know, if you was to go and shut off the breakers in your sub panel, it would still be smoking because the none of those breakers in the sub panel control that. It's, the, it's out here on the main. You'd have to come out here and trip this breaker for the dryer on the side of the house. But the biggest thing is you need to become familiar with what all the breakers do, including your sub panel. And they should be marked as to what they control. And it should be marked clearly so you can read what they, uh, what they control. You'd be surprised. I found on these exterior mains where they put paper labels on these. Well, this is in the weather. It's, th those things are going to fade in no time short. And so basically when you open up the panel, you're going to see just blank pieces of paper here. And some of them have even fallen off. So this was a very good idea this person did by using permanent marker and and making it really legible as to what these breakers control. Okay, all of us know what these are. We can't live without them. That's an air conditioner. As hot as it gets here, I don't see how anyone can live without central air conditioning. And so this is a single stage unit, which is what most houses have. But you don't never want to let this vegetation grow up around this. And I even understand that there was one HOA that required that the air conditioner be landscaped around. Well, you know, it shouldn't be growing up like this around it because it's causing this unit to really work hard. Not only that, but on the back side of this, all this vegetation may be causing fungus to grow on the, on the cooling uh, coils on the opposite side. You want to have your air conditioner serviced or HVAC system serviced twice a year. And really the best time to do that is in the fall and in the spring, you know, in the spring for the summertime, because that way, you know, during the summertime, you know, all these HVAC people are really busy and they're not going to really have much time, I think, to come out and do general servicing. And if they do, they're probably going to charge more for it. But you also don't want to keep this area cluttered up either. This is a garden hose that's been coiled up and laying over on top of the 
uh, the service lines coming into this. And so, you know, you want to keep the area clear and you want to keep it clean. You can do this yourself as far as cleaning these coils. You know, I recommend going to some of the YouTube videos on how to do that. But you do want to keep this system maintained. And this is an example of a line set that needs to be repaired. In this left photograph, you can see the copper line that's where the insulation is just probably got old and cracked and rotted off of it. Well, these lines should be protected and insulated. Uh, this also will diminish the capacity of your cooling if this is left uh, uninsulated. This line right here at the bottom, that's the condensate line that comes out and it's right there at the foundation wall. And, and you can see that there's a lot of fungus starting to grow here, which is not uncommon because of the amount of moisture that this thing produces. An example of that is in this right photograph. This is a condensate line that's coming out from the house. And notice that it's coming out more than 12 inches. The further away from the foundation, the better. And also what would be even better too, if this, instead of having leaves here, if this was all rocks, it would allow this to perk better. And the reason for that being is that these condensate lines pull anywhere between 7 and 20 gallons of water a day out of your house. That's a lot of water. And so you have, say, 15 gallons of water a day on the same area, day after day after day. You know, you got a lot of water uh, saturating this area here. I don't know if it's quite visible, but right there, that's a termite base station, and it's popped. That's the indicator that it's been tripped. That means termites have actually gone into this thing and have taken the bait and it's popped this, this red lever at the top. And the reason why this got set off at such an early stage is because termites like moist areas too. And this condensate line's given it. It's given it all the moisture the termites want. And that's another reason why it's not good for this condensate line in the left picture for it to be right there at the foundation because now Termites probably want to start making their nest here because it's got all the moisture they need. So the further away from the house, the better. But not only that, you can see like there again, all this fungus. Well, this can actually start uh, deteriorating the mortar joints. I, I mean, this can happen. Long-term moisture where it just never dries out can start weakening the mortar joints. And maybe in some cases, maybe get as far as into the wall cavity, create mold problems there. So there's many reasons to keep this condensate line away from the house. This is a condensate line that you hope you don't see water coming out of. And this is the emergency overflow. Normally they would install these over the kitchen window. And the reason they would put it at that location is that if you were standing at the kitchen sink and looking out the window, you saw water dripping down. That would let you know that you have a clogged condensate line and that you need to do something about it. But nowadays, these can be found pretty much anywhere around the soffit area of the house. And that's what it is, is the emergency overflow. That's if the other main condensate line does clog up, then it has another route for the water to escape. So if you do see water coming out of this, you need to call your HVAC company to come out and clear that other line. Or if you have the skill sets to do it, then that's what the problem is and you need to go up there and take care of that. I'm amazed about how many inspections I go to and find this problem. And I almost think that it's the homeowners know it's a problem. They just, yeah, you know, it's still working, so just leave it like it is. But this is can be a pretty significant issue here for many reasons. One, you know, this can actually burn, and so it's a fire hazard. Uh, but also, if the dryer is not running, then insects can come back in through this way. And so, not only that, but these dryer vents, uh, they're pretty cheap, cheaply made. Uh, I haven't found any of these that are 
made to what I would consider high quality standards. And so in the case of this one here on the left, more than likely this whole thing just probably needs to be replaced versus, versus being cleaned. The one on the right is has a cage on it, and that's actually against code to do this. And so anytime you have a caged vent like this, it's not right. And you can see why it's not right, because it's all clogged up now. Uh, this very little air can probably pass through this. And so you definitely don't want to have a dryer vent with a cage over the, the facing of it, because it's just simply going to clog up. But you do need to pay attention to your dryer outlets, especially if you have one that goes through the roof. Now, you really have to pay attention at this point because most of these newer houses now have this going through the roof and not the side of the house. I don't like that, and I don't like it for many reasons, one of which is it's hard now to keep this vent clean because it's going up through the roof. But there are many other reasons, too, that I'm not going to go into on this slide. But you need to, if you have one that vents through the roof, that's something that should be inspected and serviced quite frequently. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because you can make an entire series of videos about hurricane preparedness. But I highly recommend that you spend some time getting storm prepared because we do get them. I've been in many of them since like I said before, going back to 1964, Hurricane Betsy and 69 Camille and 79 Frederick and on and on. And it's just a matter of time before we get another one. And so the time to prepare for hurricanes is year round. Uh, I know all of us get geared, you know, when we hear on the, the local news channel, uh, this month is Hurricane Preparedness Month. But really every month of the year uh, should be Hurricane Preparedness Month. And for, for many reasons, this is actually going to be a pretty good tip for you. The reason why you should prepare for hurricanes in the fall and winter is that's the time where most people are not running to the stores clearing them out. And that's the time you should be going and getting staples that will last, like uh, tarps. You should definitely have several tarps because you're going to have to have, you may have to make an emergency roof repair if something comes flying through it. And it would be horrible to have a, all this water pouring into your house and knowing that a tarp could, could actually patch that until it could be fixed. But there's many things that you should prepare yourself for, for hurricanes. And I'm not going to go any longer than that, uh, than what I just said. But if you have a newer house, uh, more than likely, and you need to make sure that these are there because I've, sometimes, for whatever reason, they throw them away or they've taken them out and used them for covering up stuff. These are fabric panels here. And you want to be able to know where these are and know how they work and, and know what panel covers what because during a hurricane, when one's on the way here, you're going to be hard pressed for time. Time is really going to be crunching down your throat. And so you want to have this already rehearsed and practiced as to what these panels go to. In fact, you probably want to take a Sharpie marker and mark what each panel goes to. They may be all the same. And if that's the case, that's wonderful because you, now you don't have to wonder which panel goes to what. But you do want to make sure that they're all there. And so I've always tell, you know, my clients before they close on the house to make sure that they have all their hurricane panels because, you know, it's six months away or even a year or two away. Uh, it may be too late to, to go back and try to find out where they went. So know where they are, know, that, know how to put them on. And the right photograph is metal hurricane panels. And these are often stored in the garage because they're, they, take, they take up a lot of room. Normally the, the panels or the fabric ones are stored in the attic and that's where you most likely find them, but sometimes they're in the garage as well. But there again, these are panels that are also marked or written on the panel, you know, side window. And so that way, when the storm is on its way, you're not spending hours trying to find out which panel goes to what which window. I'm telling you, you're really going to be crunched for time 
when one starts bearing down on us, and you'll appreciate this advice. And this is another reason why you should be storm prepared. Uh, this large limb came out of a tree just during a, a very strong thunderstorm. Uh, I think it was a microburst that came down and, and took out this massive limb and also took down the neighbor's tree and laid it completely over. I mean, it's a, it looked like a tornado had come through. And I got to thinking, you know, had this limb penetrated the roof, you know, what would I have been able to do in that case? You know, it was raining pretty hard, but fortunately it didn't do that. But fortunately I also had several tarps under the house. You know, I recommend probably getting several 20 by 20 tarps, maybe 20 by 30. You know, I would have more than one of them. But we do get some pretty strong thunderstorms that come through. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a hurricane to come in here to do damage. So yeah, I mean, it's a good idea to stay storm prepared year round. This is a good slide to end the exterior section on. The next presentation will be on the interiors, but what we're looking at in this, these two photographs are the garage. And most people that have garages, they usually are attached to the house. And this was an inspection I did last year. And on the floor, what looks like dust is, is really white mildew. And what's happened is in the right photograph, there's a big gap under the door. And this has allowed hot, moist air to come into the garage area. And it's condensed onto the concrete floor. And since concrete is porous too, you can hold that moisture there. and develop all this mildew. Another problem with this is that eventually all this is going to evaporate and when it does it's going to go up into the attic area. Uh, many garages also have the attic excess here where the drop down stairs come and often when I pull these staircases down I go up and I can find the same white mildew or mold around the framework of the attic staircase. And this can also put these mold spores into the attic too. Uh, my recommendation is, is that all garages be climate controlled, but at the bare minimum, there should be no gapping under garage doors to allow moisture to come in. And also don't let the garage doors stay open during hot, humid weather. They should always be closed during those days, which is probably gonna be most days of the year. But as far as climate controlling these, they should either have a dehumidifier placed into the garage, but what I think is even a better option is a mini split or a ductless air conditioning system, especially as cheap as they've gotten. They can be installed there for a single unit, it's less than $1,000, really more around 800. And, but I would get one that has a dedicated dehumidification function built into it. The good thing about a ductless system is you can now have a, a nice working area here that's conditioned. You can, if it's wintertime, it can be heated with it, and during the summertime, it can be cool. So that's really the better option. But the main thing is, is just be aware that the garage is a high moisture content area because it's not climate controlled. And at the bare minimum also, you should put a humidity gauge in here to monitor that. Well, thanks for taking the time to watch this episode on the exteriors. Also, please go and view episode 33. We've done one on the interiors as well. That's why we separated these two apart because we know that no one wants to sit through a very long presentation of pretty much anything. And so we felt like the best way to shorten this up was to create two different episodes. Also, please go and subscribe to our channel, Southern Home Talk. We're committed to addressing the many issues that affect our Southern homes. And if you ever need a home inspector or know someone who does, please have them call South Alabama Home Inspections at area code 251-490-9892. We also do general condition inspections as well. You should probably have one of those done at least once a year. So thanks for taking the time to watch this presentation.